Why don't you start doing what's right for you? By a school vice principal turned Pied Piper who brought some children along. And he shared the word with me. And who cares if that's illegal? Lynn Schur takes us inside an explosion of religious fervor in America. Countdown to salvation. Well, next, we're going to take you to Florida where this man, a former drug addict with a long criminal record, is running a religious revival. People from all over the world are going there because they say he has the word of God and it's changed their lives. How? We'll find out when we come back. Now, a glimpse into a world many of us don't know even exists. In Pensacola, Florida, a religious spectacle is underway. Night after night, people from all over the world come by the thousands, hoping for a divine encounter. Revivals usually last only a few days, but this one has been going on for more than two years. What are people looking for inside? Lynn Shield reports nothing less than God himself. <laughs> Hollywood couldn't have created better special effects. Lord, we love you, Lord. Signs from above beckoning thousands, all hungry for divine power. They've traveled the globe to reach this unlikely Mecca. An inner city church called the Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida. What's gotten into them? Why, when many American churches are struggling with empty pews, are these worshipers camping out before daylight to live in line up to 18 hours for a good seat? I'm here because I know God is here. The power of God is so real on me that my human body cannot handle it. The message they have heard is relayed up and down the line. God is in the house. The wait is finally over. It is showtime. Inside, the energy is infectious. Gospel rhythms underscore a torrent of enthusiastic praise. This, it would be fair to say, is a party for Jesus. When the music fades, the message turns urgent. We cast out devils, we heal the sick, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray. Are we tired? We're exhausted. But then we pray, and we pray. The man pray. leading Why? these prayer warriors is evangelist Steve Hill, a repentant what sinner a with a passion for redemption. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. 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 Hill is part showman, part salesman. He didn't say that, friend. He said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Yes. Sometime around 7 p.m., he takes center stage with Pastor John Kilpatrick to lead a five-hour worship marathon. They all believe that God can touch them. And they all believe that in this place, miracles are taking place. Clearly, this is not church as usual. The worshipers packing this sanctuary four nights a week, mostly Pentecostals, say they've been left empty by dry, stale religion. Many claiming that here, God touches them for the first time. It is called a revival, literally a breath of new life into a withering faith. Revival. God's presence, they say, has ignited this spiritual revival. He's delivered me from so much, friend. Friend, when Jesus Christ came into my life, what a change. Man, wow, I want you to experience that. I want you to experience victorious living, the promises of God, your past forgiven and forgotten, freedom from addictions. In this emotional cauldron, the faithful believe broken lives are healed. 
This revival, it's about changed lives. It's about people that were hurting, people that were dying, people that were just like, like groping through the desert sands, hoping for a drink of water from somebody, and they're revived. Revivals are an American tradition, dating back to itinerant preachers who converted the masses claiming the power of Jesus. In a modern throwback to that old-time religion, worshipers at the Brownsville Revival also strive to cleanse their souls with full immersion baptisms. In the Holy Spirit. Brownsville is the country's longest-running revival in nearly a century, more than two years old. And members here are convinced they're headed towards something even grander. That's called a Great Awakening, a period when spiritual fervor sweeps across the land. They believe there have been only four in the world. My name is Christiana Bonge from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. From France, Paris. From Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, Australia. How many of you in the line are from Germany? Let me see your hand. Wow. From Argentina. I am from Ukraine. Israel, all right. This revival's power reaches far beyond Florida. The church is proud of its converts and pays special homage to those who've traveled the longest distance. Would you give a warm welcome to Steve Hill? According to those who were there, this revival began on Father's Day, 1995. Steve Hill was a visiting evangelist passing through town. Bless the Lord. Pastor John Kilpatrick invited him to his pulpit for the morning service. On Father's Day, the power of God fell, and it was awesome. We've been praying for two and a half years, and <clears throat> when it praying came Praying for in, what? Praying for revival. Hill says he felt a heightened intensity as worshipers clamored for prayer. Pastor Kilpatrick yelled to the congregation that the moment they prayed for had at last arrived. Moments later, the pastor fell to the floor, unable to rise for hours. Overwhelmed, he says, by the power of God. It's a story he likes to tell. It wasn't scary, nothing phobic. It didn't hurt. It was the most wonderful feeling that I've ever felt in my whole life. Today, the momentum shows no signs of easing. And Hill, the one-time traveling preacher, has stayed, making Brownsville home base to shepherd what he calls a movement of God. Well, the power of God was delivering uh, drug addicts from drug addiction. Alcoholics were, were given up alcoholism. And it was mir miracle after miracle, one after another, people were being set free from bondages. We started seeing this, and we realized that this is supernatural. I mean, the scum of the earth began to show up because they had heard God was coming down in power, and they needed God's power to help them. Here's what that power can look like. According to Hill and Kilpatrick, some worshipers are so filled with the Spirit, they jerk and shake uncontrollably. If you need forgiveness, if you're away from God, I want you to come right now. You need the Lord. Hurry, hurry. The service shifts hurry. into high gear after the sermon when Evangelist come Hill on. delivers his Here urgent go. call to the hurry. altar. Hurry. It sends sinners running, a countdown to salvation. Come on, get on your knees. Say, Jesus, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Jesus, now, 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 fire, 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 fire. now, now, Jesus, fire. And then the moment many long for, a prayer and a light touch that can drop some of them to the floor, able to hear, but often unable to move. It is called being slain in the spirit. In effect, a wake up call from the Holy Spirit. So when you're down there in front, talking to people and putting your hand on them, you are being a conduit for the power of God? Well, I believe that a lot of things are happening. But, but get specific with me. You're, you're standing there, I've seen you do this, you walk up to someone and you say, down. What are you saying? I am saying more of Jesus, a fresh touch from Jesus, and the power of God comes over these folks and they fall to the ground. We don't feel like we're anybody special, but God is moving through us. He has always used people. To many, Hill may seem a surprising conduit for the Word of God. A recovering alcoholic and heroin addict, he also admits to having a long criminal record. I was arrested for, for drug sales, car theft, uh, about 13 times, and uh, breaking and entering, and, and you know I had to have money to get drugs. 
The change came at 21, he says, when his mother invited a Lutheran minister home to pray for him. I didn't believe in God, but he said, say the name Jesus. So out of desperation, I looked up at the ceiling of the room and I said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I just began to say that name. And uh, the, a power came through my body. And in a matter of seconds, it was like I was brand new. I'm not using the needle anymore. I'm not drinking whiskey anymore. I'm not depending on a six pack of beer anymore. I'm not smoking pot anymore. I don't need pornography anymore. He's changed my life. And the revival, Hill says, has saved or transformed more than 100,000 lives. I used to be a skinhead. I used to hate anybody who wasn't white. God saved me, set me free. John Hall, a former skinhead, is one of a group of Revival members who say they are now on fire for Jesus. After a moment of prayer, they eagerly shared their stories of spiritual transformation. I wanted to kill my parents. You literally wanted to kill your parents? Yes, ma'am, I wanted to kill my parents. I sat down and I wrote out the perfect plan to kill both of my parents. Amen. John found redemption at the revival. He's become a ministry student, and like so many other converts, readily told his story when he was baptized. But that same woman that I wanted to kill spent every night of her life on her knees praying for me. There are also claims of physical healings. Despite a constant shaking that persisted throughout our interview, school teacher Valerie Brunn says God healed her. Tell them what God did to your neck. He healed me of a neck and back injury from a car accident. The head shaking began immediately afterwards. She says it happens whenever she's in the presence of God. She calls it a manifestation. This manifestation that I have now in my neck, um, that was a way for him to tell me that my neck is healed. There's no way that my neck could have ever withstood this, ever. I mean, before. Has it been diagnosed, what you're doing now? You mean, have I been to a doctor? Uh-huh. No, I haven't been to a doctor. And How long does the shaking tend to last? It depends. It depends on what I'm doing. When I get in God's presence, that's when it starts. So when I pray, I read my Bible, I come to church, that's when I'm shaking. Pastor Kilpatrick says he's not the least bit ashamed to have Valerie sing in his choir. But he told us that some others of his flock are fakers. They just pretend to be set in motion by spiritual forces. But both leaders adamantly denied criticism from some religious leaders that their church is like a cult, that they manipulate worshipers to elicit what's been called mindless praise. I would, I would encourage anyone who would say anything like that to come meet these mindless people. Meet Patrick Waters, who's been delivered from drug addiction. Meet the person that wanted to commit suicide but now wants to live on. That's not mindless praise. That's worship. They're, they're, they're so thankful. But neither man offers any apology for the next step in the process. The step that makes many outsiders so wary and uncomfortable. Spreading the word. And Jesus Christ has changed my life. Woe unto me if I don't talk about it. Everyone healed is taught it is his or her duty to share the experience. That's called witnessing or evangelizing. We're not supposed to push things down people's throats by any means. But I think that when they see something is real, it makes them hungry. You say it's not a religious thing, but no. the truth is it is about Jesus Christ. And no. there are people who believe in other religions, as you well know, right. who don't believe in, in Jesus Christ as the Lord. Right. So it is a religious thing. If one doesn't believe in Jesus, if one doesn't accept this, what does that make that person in this world? Lost. They're lost. Even if they don't feel lost? Even if they don't feel lost. You want to know why people hate revival? It's in your face. It'll mess with your comfort zone, friend. You'll hear things you need to hear, like get the sin out. The question is, what happens when that process seeps out of the church and into places where it's not always welcome or legal? It is exactly that in-your-face approach that's put some revival members on a collision course with the law. Well, when we come back, Lynn Scherr continues with the Pensacola Revival and a school vice principal with very strong religious beliefs who leads some students there. Does he have a right to do that? And what do their parents think? From ABC News, 2020 continues. Once again, you downs. 
Well, as we've seen, the religious revival in Pensacola, Florida, has made believers out of thousands of people. And they are then expected to spread the word to others. But how would you feel if the believer was a teacher or a school administrator? Do they have a right in that capacity to try to influence their students, possibly changing their religious beliefs forever? Lynn Scher picks up her story with a school vice principal who did just that. While the revival here in Pensacola is stirring up souls, the message being carried by one of its most fervent believers is stirring a very different set of emotions in a nearby community. An ugly controversy has arisen in the town, ironically named, Niceville. And the Holy Spirit doesn't cause disorder or dissension in a family, and it was causing that in our family, and it was, it was painful. Irma and Bud Temple, like all the folks we spoke with in Niceville, Florida, call themselves faithful families. But they also believe that religion belongs at home and in church, not in the public high school, which is where they say their children learned of the Brownsville revival. Worse yet, they charge, the message was preached by the school's own vice principal, Dr. Chip Woolwine. The temples, who asked us to keep their religious denomination private, but are not Pentecostals, say they became concerned when their 16-year-old daughter began to embrace the practices emanating from the revival. When did things really start getting bad with your younger daughter? Well, my daughter picked me up at the airport one day. She was driving. I got in the car and she was driving down the road and she was shaking, jittering, bouncing. Whatever term you want to use, she was not you know, as if she was afflicted with some sort of uh, disease. And I finally said, what is wrong with you? What is, what are you doing? What's the matter? And she said, oh, I'm just filled with the Holy Spirit. And it hit me like a ton of bricks and I almost fell out of the car. The temples claim she only started her shaking after attending one of the revival services with Vice Principal Woolwine. A devout Christian, he readily admits the revival changed his own life, and that at times he escorted up to 50 students to the church. Was I excited about the fact that I knew if some kids could get there that they could get squared away with the Lord and, and, and get off drugs and alcohol and stuff like that? Sure. Dr. Woolwine has been called the Pied Piper of Brownsville, a nickname not meant to be flattering to a man generally well-respected by both parents and students. And that, say parents, is part of the problem. And, and a lot of those youth, they're young youth, and, and, and they're vulnerable, and they're, influ they're easily influenced, and they look at an administrator and a teacher, uh, and they look up to them. Dr. Woolwine insists the religious conversations were largely initiated by students. But some parents argue that preaching religious beliefs is their responsibility and inappropriate behavior for a public school administrator. Did you ever say to one of the kids that if, if he or she weren't saved, um, he or she would go to hell? Well, that, that, again, you're talking about um, thousands of, of conversations, uh, but I, don't, I, don't, I do not have any recollection ever of looking at a kid and saying, if you don't believe like I do, you're going to hell. Would you ever say that to a kid? Mm -mm. But if a kid were to just come to me and say, if I don't have Jesus in my heart for my Savior, that I'm going to hell, if he were to just corner me like that, then yeah, you'd have to say, yeah, you know. And you think that was, it's perfectly appropriate for you to have been, if you ever said something like that, to do that within the, the context of your being vice principal and this being a school? Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that at all. Right now we're in a major, exciting situation at Niceville High School. Some of you know about it. We got an assistant principal over there and some other... Revival leaders have rallied behind Dr. Woolwine. They see his cause as an opportunity to advance national support for school prayer. What I'm telling you is there's a nation out there lying dormant. And they're waiting for somebody, some voice, some church, to, some, some governmental on-fire leader to rise up and go, Wait just a cotton-picking minute! Don't you tell me we can't pray in our school. Dr. Woolwine's religious activities prompted a school board investigation. He was accused of holding Bible counseling sessions in his office and baptizing students at a local bayou. His supporters in this Bible Belt community were outraged by the charges. And so vehement about it, most of his accusers say they were afraid to speak out. 
Still in June at an emotional school board meeting, Dr. Wilwan was found guilty of violating a policy requiring religious neutrality. If the laws are wrong, then I invite people to seek out legislative remedy and change the law. But while the school board ruling was based on the separation of church and state, Woolwine supporters say the case is a First Amendment issue. They believe students have the right to seek and receive religious counseling at any school. Be transferred to a position at uh, MIS. <laughs> Chip Wilwan was removed from his job as vice principal and shifted into a position where he'll no longer come in contact with students. And I'm going to to do what's right for the boys and girls. No, 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 don't continue means you've done it in the past. Mike Temple and the other parents who spoke out are afraid of repercussions, worried that this issue will not quietly disappear. What goes through your head when you think about what might happen? What are you worried about? Something somebody might say, something somebody might do? Well, I'm more concerned about uh, what somebody might do. I'm, I'm concerned about the activities of the zealous people, the very, very fanatical people. You can't predict what a fanatic's going to do. School board member Don Gates says he's received several death threats since launching the investigation. But he claims he has no regrets concerning the board's verdict. What do you think it means that you've, that the board has disciplined Dr. Woolwine. What we're trying to say is that nobody uses our public schools as the staging area for an attack on anybody's religious faith or as a recruiting station to try to get kids to give up the faiths they're taught in their own homes and follow some Pied Piper, however well-intentioned he might think he is. Do I feel like I've done anything wrong? Absolutely not. Do I feel like I'm guilty of, of violating school board policy? Absolutely not. If you had things to do over again at Niceville High School, starting with the day you went to the Brownsville Revival, what, if anything, would you do differently? <sighs> Nothing. <laughs> I wouldn't do anything differently. To save my job, to save my career, which one of the students would I send back to to the awful life that they were experiencing? And my answer is, I wouldn't send any of them back to save my job or my career. I started skipping school and running away, and I was in juvenile detention center and everything like that. Because I was skipping school, I ended up in the vice principal's office. God bless you, Dr. Woolwine. Despite the ruling, Dr. Woolwine shows no sign of walking away from his students. He says he's proud of helping set law students straight, and he recently attended a former student's baptism at the revival, a student he admits helping and, to find Jesus. And, and he invited me to Bible study, and he shared the word with me. And who cares if that's illegal? And... <laughs> What's happening with, with Dr. Woolwine is so needed right now in America if a, a teenager needs prayer, you know, and they're going through a hard time with, with a, their, their boyfriend or girlfriend. Don't slip them a condom. Talk to them about getting their life together. Evangelist Hill and Pastor Kilpatrick and even Dr. Woolwine admit they are short on statistics, that they don't know how long the conversions will last, but that hasn't lessened their zeal. There is an awakening coming to America that is going to shake this nation. It's going to sweep from coast to coast, from north to south. It the revival the is now turning into a crusade, with the evangelist and the pastor taking their message on the road to pave the way for the next step, the nationwide awakening they hope will follow. It's their way of using the revival fires from Pensacola to spread a wave of religious passion. God is going to move throughout this land. It's going to hit the Baptists, the Methodists. It's going to hit the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, the Pentecostals. There is an awakening coming. But for all his faith and hope, the evangelist who was here when it all began says he still takes nothing for granted. I, I crawl in here every night, uh, spiritually speaking. I'm humbled, and, and I say, God, would it be possible for you to do it one more night? Would it be possible for something to happen one more night? Now.
Fresh anointed. I understand Dr. Woolwine is appealing to the Florida State School Board to get his job back. And guess who is representing him? It is a legal organization headed by Pat Robertson. Well, next, you have to be